I am a relation, a distant relation, a distant cousin to Bruce Ismay, who was on the Titanic. And of course, uh, the Ismay family from Cumbria, which he was part of. Um, Thomas Henry Ismay, uh, and my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was a third cousin to him, to, to uh, Bruce Ismay's father, who was Thomas Henry Ismay, who founded the White Star Line, uh, which was originally wool clippers, which he'd, uh, a, a line of wool clippers, which he'd purchased, Australian wool clippers, called the White Star Line, and that's how he built up the Ismay Emery Steam Navigation Company, and uh, ultimately the Titanic, which was one of his ships, or well, it became one of his son's ships, because his son was then chairman of the company, and he was on board the Titanic. And what do you know of what happened with his journey? Well, being an Ismay, I know an awful lot. Uh, a lot of publications say that my particular branch of the family is the nearest branch to Thomas Henry and Bruce Ismay with the same surname. Uh, we know he was chairman of the White Star Line at the time. We know he used to go, if he could, on all his ship's maiden voyages. Titanic was no exception. Uh, he was on board. He did a lot of, uh, of work with the designers in making it one of the most cutting edge ships of its time. Uh, leading technology with radio and uh, watertight compartments, uh, which were, you know, pretty unknown at the time, or pretty rare at the time. We know um, he, he designed an awful lot of the interiors, or if not designed them, he oversaw the design of it all, or a lot of it, being the chairman. Uh, he unfortunately, or fortunately, was on board that fateful uh, day in April, 1912 when it did hit an iceberg and instead of just damaging one of the watertight compartments it ruptured an awful lot of them and the ship foundered and ultimately sunk. I know of course that uh, there's lots of terrible things levelled at him which in my view are totally unfair. Uh, this was borne out by the uh, inquiries both the American one and the British one who found him in no way to be blamed for it. Uh, the chairman of the British Inquiry even commented and said that certain very unkind remarks had been said about him, and he felt, it, although it wasn't part of his duty to do so, it was necessary for him to say that uh, if Bruce hadn't have uh, entered that uh, half-empty boat, which he found with Mr Carter, um, and I've never been able to find this out, but I was told he was related to Jimmy Carter, uh, the uh, President of the United States, maybe your research should check that, um, and got on board uh, as it was being lowered with no one else in the facility, and this was borne out by other people. The barber uh, gave a statement to that effect on the, on the Titanic, and other people. All it had done was meant one more casualty to the casualty list, and he couldn't see that would have served any useful purpose. Uh, and uh, he was just lambooned. This was the chairman. Lots of people saying he was an old man and uh, didn't know what he was doing and didn't run the inquiry properly. Uh, just as they said terrible things about Bruce, that he dressed up as a woman and uh, disguised himself to get on board a lifeboat and all sorts of terrible things. And it was one of the last collapsibles, which was half wood and half canvas, but they managed to get off. Uh, and he'd been helping people board lifeboats for a considerable time before um, he managed to get a lifeboat himself. Uh, I see no blame attached to him at all. And I really, it really upsets me, even to this day, to see books coming out saying terrible things about him. Uh, and they, I think they ought to be ashamed of themselves. That's my view. There are a lot of people that have a connection to the Titanic story and the events of what happened in April of 1912. But a lot of these people discover their story all of a sudden and maybe it's through family research or indeed a story passed down and suddenly told to them one day. The Titanic, I'm guessing, has always been with your family. Totally. But you must have had a time when someone sat you down and said, this is our actual connection, these are the events, this is what happened, this is our close connection to the Titanic. Can you remember that? How did it happen? 
Uh, my father was always convinced that we were closely connected to them. Well, collected to them because, you know, we all come from Cumbria in a very close-knit area of Cumberland. My father was born in Whitehaven. Um, Thomas Henry Ismay was born in Maryport, which is just up the, up, the, up the coast. I mean, it's a very close part of Cumbria. And uh, there is May's relations of mine there today. Um, so we, you know, we, we had, there was no doubt we were related to them. Uh, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't escape it. And we can't escape it today. Even my youngest daughter, um, she's at university at the moment. And when she knew this program was coming along, uh, and it was the, the year it is, she said to me, oh, great, that means I'm going to be asked by so many people if I'm related to Bruce Sisme of the Titanic. You can't escape it. And how do you feel with that, uh, with that connection, with that relation? Um, myself, I'm, I'm not at all uh, upset about it. Uh, I see Bruce as a man of his time. Um, I take 1912 as a time when it was totally different from today. People try and put uh, 1912 in today's world, and it's not, of course. There were different procedures, uh, uh, different attitudes, and, uh, you know, they segregated people differently. People of different classes didn't talk to each other, uh, only on a business footing, and everything was so different. But to try and make... Bruce the scapegoat he was, I think it's disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. And I'm absolutely surprised that people are still prepared to peddle it in this, you know, year 2012. I mean, I did see some extracts from a book published last year and I thought to myself, what cheap drives that Bruce is made, literally to sell a book and make a few buck. You know, uh, I think it's time that it was stopped. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today just to see how you're running things and how you're doing things. There must be a lot of misconceptions uh, following an event that happened over 100, well, 100 years ago. Yes. What do you say to those people then when you come across someone mm. that has a misconception, maybe something mm. against Bruce or maybe something that is, as you believe, completely wrong? Mm. How, do you, how do you deal with that? I, uh, I never found anyone... Uh, actually contact me directly and have any uh, adverse comments about Bruce. I've only seen it in print and heard it on, on you know, the, the media, etc. Uh, I've never actually had... I've had people contact me and write and ask me if I could give them information about Bruce. Um, but it's never been a, a negative. It's always been positive. And it's never been, um, you know, um, angled against Bruce. Um, so I haven't really come across that. I've only seen it in print and seen it on, you know, uh, film and things like that. And how does it feel when you're watching, say, one of those films and you see something that doesn't perhaps feel quite right or something you think that's done particularly well and does do the situation justice? You must feel like you have such a, an interest and such an attachment to it, surely? Yes, you can't you can't get away from it because you've got the same family name. You can't you can't you know. Uh, I could say, well, he's you know, I'm not descended from him. I'm just a relation of his. You know, I can I can say, well, you know, take no notice of what happens. But you feel you are involved. You feel you know that the record should be put right, and especially when they're you know serious um, discrepancies in what they're saying, and there are an awful lot. Um, but. Uh, Basically, I I'm, 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 I'm hope that this, in this coming year we're going to see a change of attitude and people you know, won't try and make him the scapegoat he was. Um, lots of things changed after the sinking of the Titanic. You know, lifeboats were set for the tonnage, etc., and for the number of, uh, of, of people actually on board. And uh, you know, where um, they had a radio set, it had to be constantly manned and they didn't go off at night and leave it shut down, you know, as it did at the time of the Titanic. So a lot of good came from it. And, you know, uh, uh, that's the positive things. And they're the nice things to think about. That uh, You know, it was a new ship. It was cutting-edge technology at the time. Um, very few ships had uh, Marconi radio. Uh, very few ships had watertight compartments. You know, it was built on a most luxurious fa in a most luxurious fashion. Uh, and uh, after that... Um, terrible accident, um, regulations were tightened up, 
things were done which should have been done years before, and a lot of positive things came out from it. And I think that's what we should be looking at, and not trying to blame poor old Bruce, who was the scapegoat and has been the whipping boy all these years, uh, and people who write books and uh, make films and use uh, things which are in these films which have never been corroborated as true, uh, only hearsay, and even come on the television and say, well, we've no proof it actually happened, but it, it probably happened. Um, they shouldn't do that sort of thing. Are there any particular examples of things that you, you always remember and think, that is completely incorrect, or we should not be supporting that claim without evidence? Well, I remember in that famous film Titanic, there was a, 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 a clip where it showed a woman passenger overhearing Bruce saying, uh, not words to the effect of speed up, but, you know, let's see what she can do or something to that effect. And later on the television, I saw one of the producers or one of the senior people of that film being interviewed, and they said, well, did it actually happen? And they said, no, it's never been corroborated, but it probably did. Uh, and I thought to myself uh, how terrible that was. And I know in that film where uh, one Scottish um, uh, officer on board Titanic, uh, uh, they, the, the, the Scottish village where he lived, complained so much about the way he was treated in the film that the film paid them some compensation or paid them some money for a memorial to him or, or something on those lines because what they were saying about him had never been corroborated. It was just hearsay. And this is what you get in films. And, and once things go into press and once they go into films, people treat them as being true. As they, they treat the fact that, they, that in one article it said that Bruce is made dressed as a woman, which of course he didn't. And uh, that's been bandied about for years. Um, so, you know, yes, it, is, uh, it, it does uh, come to you when you hear things which are totally, you know, have never been corroborated and never can be proven to be true and are just used because it sounds good and sells films and sells books and uh, probably promotes programmes. But it must anger you. Yeah, well, yes, I'm, I just feel... Um, I wouldn't like to be in the same position myself, to be treated like that. We think we're a fair society, but Bruce is may still being given a pretty rough ride at the moment, even today. Not so rough as he was in the early days. And of course it was noted that the American press didn't like Bruce because he wasn't very good at giving interviews. And they, uh, it was noted that the chief of the big uh, corporation there, I think his name was Morgan, uh, had, it, had it in for Bruce Ismay, because uh, uh, um, Bruce Ismay had fallen out with him some years before, and that didn't help. And he was one of the main people who said such libelous things against him. So when you first heard about whether you were, I presume you were a child, and you first heard about all these extraordinary, <laughs> close, powerful <laughs> connections that you had to this piece of world history, have you ever been tempted to do your own investigating, your own research? Um, well, uh, from the very beginning, uh, when the Ismay family story was written by W.J. Walton, I think it is, um, my grandfather was approached, who lived in Whitehaven, Cumberland, and asked to give his information to the author. But the author had um, all the um, family, although they weren't Ismay's, um, help. In, in producing his book. He'd got all the private letters and all sorts of things. And it doesn't only give the information on the Titanic, it gives the formation of the White Star Line and uh, about how um, uh, the, Joseph and uh, Thomas, where they were born and, and, and all the other personal details. So um, I remember as a young boy, um, my father telling me that my grandfather had been approached by the author and um, this was all, was all talked about within the family and um, then of course it was produced and uh, it, I think it was produced privately. I have a copy of the Esme family story, The White Star Line. I, my brother tried to buy one the other day and they want £600 for them in America, second-hand copies. <laughs> Um, but he gives a lot of uh, facts and a lot of uh, private letters, uh, such as a, an army officer wrote to Bruce after the uh, Titanic and said how sorry he was that such 
terrible lies were being said about him. And he said he uh, was uh, shipwrecked on one ship, which I unfortunately can't remember the name of. And the papers said, army officer swims to safety while women and children die. And he said, of course, technically he did. He, he, and he put in his letter, I did swim to safety, but I couldn't have helped the women and children even if I wanted to. And uh, he, he said how he felt for Bruce Ismay. And there were a lot of letters uh, similar to that. Uh, given over to the author. Amongst your family, were there different reactions to the parts that your grandfather played? Were, did they deal with it in different ways? Did they talk about it in a different tone, in a different way? No, I think everyone's of the same opinion that, that Bruce was used as a scapegoat. Uh, it was new technology. It was a, you know, a cutting edge at the time. Uh, he complied with everything. Yes, he could have put a lot, loads more lifeboats on the ship. Whether that, that would have helped, because when it tipped over, a lot of the, even the ones which were on there couldn't be launched. Um, but he had there was apparently uh, enough uh, to comply with regulations, and I understand more than enough. Uh, and he, of course, thought with all the waterproof compartments and the. Uh, uh, the Marconi uh, radio, uh, that it was totally safe, as did all the, most of the passengers. They couldn't believe that, that it was sinking. And here we are, 100 years mm. on since the events of April mm. 1912. How do you think we should be reflecting upon it? Well, we should say that, you know, it was a terrible accident. Nobody thought there'd be ice around, although there was ice warnings, of course, uh, at that time of year. It was very unusual. Um, th there's... Uh, there's arguments that uh, they could have turned the boat earlier um, because uh, they did sight the iceberg a few minutes before they actually did anything but I mean it's all conjecture when you until you put yourself in those positions but to say that Bruce was any way to blame I mean you know which what one of us would have stood there and said I can't help any more people I've helped load the boat boats for two and a half hours or two hours as it was here's a boat going down half full there's no one around I've got Mr Carter with me I got in and would anybody have said no I'm going to stand here and die and add another another men, member of the casualty list it doesn't make sense and to keep churning this out time after time is amazing, especially in this day and age. And he lived in Ireland for many years in uh, Utrard, uh, Costello Lodge. And I happened to be there in the 60s, just by chance. And the people in the village there said to me, Mr Ismay, are you related to Bruce, who was up? And I said, well, yes. And they said, well, he did such great things here in Ireland. He helped the school, he gave money to the school children, he gave money to the different charities around here. We think a world of him here. And he, his, of course his eldest son died with Paddy, somebody or other up the road in the Irish Guards on active service in the Second World War, which was a shame. Uh, and he's known there and remembered there to this day. And there is a stone in the, in the grounds of, uh, uh, of the lodge. Uh, it was owned then by an American fishing syndicate because it had uh, some quite big salmon locks attached to it. And it has a, 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 a memory of Joseph Bruce's May, who loved all wild and solitary places as boundless as we wish our hearts to be. And there's a little bit more to the verse, and it uh, was quite interesting. Uh, so, and, of course, he did give an awful lot of uh, help to charities and uh, other things right up to he died. Um, lots of sailors, um, uh, charities got an awful lot of money from Bruce Ismay, as he did all his life. Uh, so, you know, um, to, to make him out to be a villain is very wrong. But thank you anyway. <laughs>